We study billionaires, and this is episode 83 of The Investor's Podcast. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll read the books and summarize the lessons. They'll test the waters and tell you when it's cold. They'll give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. Hey, everyone. How you doing out there? This is Preston Pish, and I'm your host for The Investor's Podcast. And as usual, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson, out in Denmark. And today we've got a book for you, and this book was written by a billionaire, and his name is T. Boone Pickens, and I'm sure many people out there know of T. Boone Pickens. He's on the national news, financial news media all the time talking about oil. So the book that we read, and this book was kind of older, so I think a lot of the information, not a lot of it, but some of the information, and it was a little outdated with his respect to peak oil and things like that. But the book was written, it says a copyright of 2008, and the name of the book is The First Billion is the Hardest. So that was his cliche on, you know, people that say the first million's the hardest. Reading through this, uh, Stig, what you think, buddy? I weren't too crazy about it. I think his whole discussion about energy independence was extremely interesting. But I kind of feel like this was his legacy book. He would like people to remember exactly what the book says in like 50 years from now. And what I would really like to learn from a billionaire would be something like Oprah's book. This is the life lessons. I don't think it was kind of a a life lessons book. It's more like, see how I created this and see how my sports team won all these events. (laughs) No, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I didn't really know what to say other than I guess I didn't really like it. But. You hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what it was. Now that you said that, it it makes perfect sense. He was really trying to annotate and put into writing what it was that he did through all the years. And it wasn't necessarily like he was trying to teach other people how to do it. I think he was just trying to document, hey, I did all these things. That's kind of how I read it. Yeah, totally. I, I completely agree with you. So let's give some folks a little bit of the background. So it's not, well, I can't say it's not all bad. The book was long for me, and I guess I judge my, the way I I, I read books is, you know, everyone knows I use audibles and that Stig uses audibles, but whenever I'm going through the book, if it's something that I'm just kind of dreading to put on and listen to, I already know that that's probably not, you know, a book I really want to talk about on the show, and this unfortunately was one of those books, but whenever I looked at the paperback version of this book, and I'm, I'm holding it up right now and I'm flipping through it, it's really kind of a short book. It's only like 240 pages or something. And the text in it is pretty big. But listening to the audiobook, it seemed like I it just kept going and going and like it would never end. And I guess the reason that it was kind of hard to listen to was just because he talks about deal after deal after deal, which is kind of interesting to hear the discussion of like, hey, I started off doing this, which was he was a geology major in college. He went to Oklahoma State University And after he got that degree, he graduated and it kind of just skims over this part of the book pretty quickly. Wouldn't you agree, Stig? It didn't really talk about how he acquired his first, you know, $5 million. It really doesn't get into that, which I kind of found. Because I mean, that's where I think a lot of people really need a lot of guidance. Like, hey, I saw I did this and this is the way I saw things. This is the way I thought about things. He really didn't do that at all. It was just kind of like, yeah, so I got this geology degree. I worked, you know, a little bit as a person in the workforce. And then next thing you know, I started my own company. And then I did this acquisition. I think he he did that by raising money from friends and relatives, something like that. But he didn't really go into depth with it. It was more like, oh, I was broke and I had no money. My wife thought it was crazy. And then I bought an oil company. The first million didn't seem to be the hardest for for T-Bone Pickens for sure. The first million was definitely not the hardest as it seemed like it was just like from family and friends and just came from magic. So that was definitely a complaint of the book. Instead of naming every one of these, uh, and I, I want to tell people, if you're listening to this and you're wondering what the end of the show, so the show is going to be broken into two different segments. We're doing the first segment, and I apologize for not saying this up front, but we're doing the, the review of the book here, and it's not going to be really a long review. And then we're going to do three questions from the audience at the end. So if you're not really liking the review, just kind of hang on, and we're going to get to some of these questions from the audience. So he started doing all these different acquisitions. And instead of naming all these different acquisitions, I'd rather talk about, I guess, the style in which he was going about these acquisitions. So 
he's out there, he's seeing other companies that are competitors to his in the market, and he's making different bids for, you know, trying to buy them out, doing basically a hostile takeover with the controlling interest in the shares. And that's kind of how he got his notoriety. In 1985, I believe it was, 1985, Time Magazine ran a front cover with his picture basically describing him as this, you know, oil tycoon takeover kind of guy. And that's where he really started to get a lot of notoriety after that Time Magazine article and front page review. So the rest is kind of history as far as him just continuing to grow his business, continuing to do these hostile takeovers, kind of like a Carl Icahn kind of way of investing. But he doesn't really get into, and again, this is my frustration with the book, he doesn't really get into his mindset of how he was valuing companies, what he was doing to look at competitive advantages of of owning it and like the strategic part of it. Yeah, I think in consideration of that, Preston, I, I liked his discussion about always thinking like an owner. And I really thought about you, Preston, actually. You talked about that so many times whenever you see a, a business, like how do they operate and really the teaching from t Piggins. Now, you can do this different ways. And what he did was more like as an activist investor, if you call it like that. You mentioned Carl Icahn. It's somewhat the same approach. You acquire a lot of shares uh, if, and you don't like the management. And then you, you struggle a lot, but then you might be able to realize some of the, the value in this company. And I completely admire that approach. I think it's really good that some people are doing that. I think personally, I might be more into Buffett's style where he, he doesn't do hostile takeovers because it also seemed like even though t and Pickens was very successful with this activist approach, it also seemed like he suffered a lot personally, which I guess you do whenever you are fighting with other people. And one thing I, I really like, and this, this was just a, a short anecdote, but it, was, it just said something about corporate governance in the 50s and 60s. And he's talking about the Union Oil Company out there in California and talking about how managements looked at shareholders. And he's talking about the largest individual shareholder uh, in the Union Oil Company, it's later to be Unical, and he proposed a higher dividend. And to that, uh, during the annual meeting, the CEO responded, why would we give away money to a bunch of people that we don't know? And uh, I think that that was obviously, that was a horrible answer to give. But I think even today, you see a lot of horrible management decisions. So even though I might not do it myself, I, I think it's important that we have people like t Piggins Pickens and Carl Icahn to fight the, the managements out there. So his company kind of wrapping up his initial start to his career that really kind of gave him the notoriety in his name is, so the name of the company that he was running and operating and he found was Mesa. So what I found kind of strange is after he sold Mesa, and I think that this happened in 1996, 97 is when he sold Mesa. And it was kind of like this didn't really end very well. The way he sold it, he kind of got forced out and... It was an interesting part of the book to kind of hear him talk about his uh, leaving Mesa. But he had, a, you know, obviously a, a very large amount of money after he was forced out and he started a new company. He, did he go through a divorce at this point in time? I can't remember where that kind of lined up. I think so. Yeah, it all happened yeah. at, the, at the same time where he went through a divorce and he kind of talks about all that part of it and the troubles and kind of the just enduring losing his company, losing his family. So I appreciate his honesty and kind of talking about that in the book. I think that that says a lot about him. Then after that, he went out and he started a new company called BP Capital Management. From what I can understand in the book, this was just basically a futures company. Where he's out there trading futures contracts. Yeah, well, there was a funny story about he had to take the license, right? He couldn't be licensed to do it because he failed several times. Yeah, yeah I <laughs> forgot about this. Yeah, you're right. Go ahead. Tell the story, Stig. This is good. It was just like he wanted to start this company and, and then someone you know patted him on the shoulder and said, well, you can't just set one, that up. And clearly, you know, a guy like T. Wynn Piggins, he would just set it up like, I'll figure it out. But he was forced to, uh, to be licensed and couldn't pass the exam. And people coming up to him saying, aren't you T. Wynn Piggins? Didn't you write the book on commodities, the book on oil? Yeah. So he took it through. I think he passed on the third time of taking this commodities test that was required for him to get licensed. And I love the fact that he told this in the book because, to be honest with you, I might have left that out of my book. 
<laughs> but I was, I was really impressed that he told the story. I think that that you know, for how much of the other parts of the book that I thought were egotistical, I was happy that he left that in there because it was a funny story, and I think that it was, you know, it it made him seem human, you know. You know, in the book, he talks about the same person was administering the test and just kind of looking at him like, is this dude ever going to pass? And then on the third try, he basically brokered a deal with the person who was administering the test that he could use a calculator. He could have as much time as he wanted, even though it was a time <laughs> test and and on and on. And, and he did pass the last time. So, yeah, Chris, then what you got to admire is that he was 67 or something like that. And like all the other guys that were like, 20s whatever yeah. yeah yeah he was like he was really old at this point so he's this old dude who's you know this oil tycoon just sitting in the in the room taking this test with these 20 somethings and could not pass it so interesting start to his career at bp capital management did extraordinarily well as a futures trader now here's where i find this really interesting so he started the company in 1997 2006, so fast forwarding almost a decade, he earned $990 million from his equity in the two funds and $120 million uh, from his share of the 20% fees applied to the fund's profits. So, I mean, he made a billion dollars is what it comes out to be. And his net worth right now is about a billion. And he's given away a lot. I want to say $900 million or something. Hold on here. I got the number. Yeah, it's close to... I want to say almost a billion dollars is what he's given away. So what he's really kind of a master of the years is probably two billion. His net worth is around a billion, maybe a little shy of that right now. So he he made his money and he did it through futures and he did it in the oil industry. Now, what I find really interesting is when you've listened to him in the news recently, and I'm talking in the last year, you go back to the start of 2015, kind of that first quarter, second quarter when oil was really getting punished and Boone Pickens was on every national financial news network saying oil's going to be $70 by the end of the year. Oil's going to be $70 by the end of the year. Then when you get into the really deep, disgusting part of this oil glut that's been happening, when oil got into like the $30 range, he was still singing the tune, oil's going to be $70 by the end of the year. And he has been so far off the mark with this. I mean, not even close to being on the mark with this, that it's, it's not even funny. And if I was going to say, and, and who am I to say anything, especially when you're dealing with a guy who's a, as accomplished in oil as, as much as him. But I think the thing that he's missing is he's not understanding the, the correlation and the relationship between currencies and commodities. I really don't think he gets that based on his recommendations and his comments in the past year. Now, I could be completely wrong, and that might be really egotistic for me to say that, but that's where I think he's making the mistake. So I'm curious to hear Stig's thoughts on this. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting too because I also had to look up T Bone Pickens' current view. Um, and I think Preston, you sent me in like in a video like a few months back when he's sitting discussing with Carl Icon, and it's it's kind of fun because I can't remember the last time I, I saw an interview or read something with T Bone Pickens where he he didn't say like oil is gonna rebound tomorrow, but I guess people just laugh out there and say that that I've been saying the same thing on the podcast. So <laughs> so. Uh, I think it's really interesting that he talks about how he looks at fundamentals when he is investing in oil. And he's saying, even though I am a trader to some extent, I don't cut off my profit saying after a profit 25%. That's not how I invest. I look at the fundamentals. I look at the weather. I look at storage, all of that. But what I think I missed from the book is him more going into depth with how he actually were looking at the fundamentals. Because I think I re-listened to that three or four times just to be sure I really got it, and I didn't get it. So I had the exact same experience. Experience. I was really listening to that part because when he gets into how I fundamentally look at creating oil futures, I mean, for me, that's really what I'm wanting to know and hear is his, his thought process. But you know what I took away from it? He just kept bringing up the weather the whole time. He just kept talking about how when the weather is bad and the weather is good, then, uh, you know, the price is going to move because you're going to have a draw and you're going to have an oversupply or under, you know, undersupply. And and I'm thinking that's a short term kind of thing. Like that's a a quarter kind of trade, not a five year play. And then like in the same breath, he turns around and says, I hold and I, I let my gains run for five years. And I'm thinking this does not make sense. My impression of his BP capital management portion was just he hit the market at the right time that was my that's the way i took it i was like he hit the market at the right time and just really if he was in the market right now and trading bp capital he'd be getting crushed absolutely crushed 
So do you agree with that analysis that you think it was a little bit of luck? You know, I think it's hard if you made so much money as Tipu and Pickens really to dedicate to really to say that it's luck. But you look at how the uh, fees were structured. He was charging 1.75% each year. Yeah. And he was it was so easy for him to attract capital, at least compared to, you know, your, your, your regular guy down the street, because he knew so many billionaires and multimillionaires back then. So it was somewhat easy for him to set up, even though he says that he only had six employees from Mesa when he was starting. You know, that was quickly 400 people because it was so easy for him to to hire the right people. And all the employees bought stock in the company. And then he talks about this incentives fee of 20%, which is obviously extremely profitable whenever you start making uh, like the returns, whether or not it's, it's luck. And I really disliked what he said about that he wanted the incentive fee of 20%. I'm like, if you're charging almost 2% a year, do you really need an incentive <laughs> To provide a good performance for yourself and your shareholder yourself and to the other shareholders and was just completely contradictory to, to what he has said like previously in the book. Whenever I look at how commodity cycles, particularly in oil, go as far as the waves and the, the dips and the highs on it, when you look back, when he was in the commodity business, he was in the boom time of, of oil. You know, when you look at the, the housing crisis and all that stuff, Oil really did well from that time frame from like 2000, call it one, two, to up until 2008. Please don't take this out of context like I'm implying that that's what Boone Pickens was because he is very accomplished as a manager in the oil sector before all this happened. But I'm just saying his timing was amazing. Now, whenever we come out of this contraction that I believe that we're approaching right now, Let's say in about a year, two years from now, I feel like oil will do just phenomenal again for another five to seven year tear. And so I just kind of see Pickens, the timing of when he stood up this this BP capital management as being like right in that ripping zone of easy performance. So that's my opinion. And then when you're charging 20 percent fees on every profit that you make, I mean, it's a little hard not to make money when you have that capital structure and you got a bunch of millionaire friends. So. That's my impression. I I really hope that I'm not being over simplistic here, and I'm sure I'm sure that I am. So in the last part of the book, and I like this, I really like the fact that he brought this up in the book. He talks about energy de- independence. So Stig's going to talk a little bit about some of these comments here. Yeah, that was definitely one of the discussions that I like the most, and partly it was politically loaded, which was extremely interesting, and. It might look like, if you look, watch the news right now, that the U.S. is producing so much oil, which they are, that they don't need to import. But actually, the U.S. is still importing a lot of oil. They are importing, uh, the most recent number I find is 6.8 million barrels a day. Just to give you some numbers for comparison, the U.S. consumes close to 20 million barrels per day. It's really interesting that you will have like a country like the U.S. that might consume like 20-something percent of the world consumption of oil, but still it's only 5% of the population. So the U.S., the way it structures, is very dependent on oil. And one thing where I think he missed the mark is his distinction between energy and electricity. Well, clearly he, he knows what he's talking about, but I think he made it sound very easy when he talked about his wind investments. So for instance, he's saying that you will have one three megawatt wind turbine and that can produce the same energy as 12,000 barrels of oil in a year. And while that's true, I think he should mention that electricity is a form of energy. You can't just replace fossil fuels with windmill. And I think you could kind of get that impression whenever you are reading his book. And he places a lot of emphasis on renewables. And I think I've been bashing renewables a few times before here on the show. And it's not because I think renewables is, is, is a, a bad thing. I think it's great and I think it's, it's good for the environment. But I think he misrepresents how important they really are. Yeah, so Stig, I think that the, the point that you're talking about is one of the reasons why Elon Musk has been able to really kind of take the the energy market by storm is because what you just said as far as oil being different than electric energy and a different form of how you can kind of convert that and, and transportation really being reliant on oil because it's it's portable and it can kind of move with the vehicle, that's where Elon Musk has really said, you know what, you're right, but... Let me tackle that problem and try to make it so that electricity can be transportable and go on the move. 
And that's where he's placing all of his emphasis and really his hardcore technology of in his technological development of the products that he's designing is so that electricity can be portable and try to bridge that gap. And you don't really see other people going at it as hard as Elon Musk. Maybe he just has a better branding and marketing campaign than other people out there. But, you know, he's the guy who's really trying to make that happen. And you can see that it's really paying off for him because he's bridging that gap. But I'm sorry to interrupt and keep keep rolling. No, it's actually a really good point because I was typing up some notes and I actually had a section about Elon Musk. I think you bring up a good point here, Preston, because... Renewables uh, has its limitations, and especially whenever the book was written, but still today, because in general, you can't store electricity in meaningful amounts, which also means that you can't transport it. It has to be used right now. And you might be thinking about Elon Musk and Tesla, and he has done some amazing research in terms of building batteries. But I also got to say, like, if you look at the effect of what they can uh, store, it's really close to zero if you look at it in a broad American perspective. Now, that doesn't mean that the technology is not there. It doesn't mean that it's something that could be better in the future. But as it is right now, it's just very, very difficult. And I would like actually, without being too geeky, because I think I also mentioned this on a podcast, I used to work in energy trading and I've been managing some of this renewable energy. And it's just evident for me to see the limitations because you might be thinking, well, isn't the wind always blowing somewhere? Is the sun always shining somewhere? Couldn't we just use that electricity? Well, the problem is that you have different limitations. So for instance, you have something like cables. You can't just transport something in a cable that can't be there. And you have power grids. So that means that sometimes you can't transfer something to another power grid, which basically means that just because the wind is blowing in Oklahoma, that doesn't mean that you could use it in New York. That's just not how it works. Well, and Stig, what you're saying is is that under the current infrastructure, it can't take place. But we could, as a world, start developing more infrastructure in order to handle those demands if that would be something we'd try to move towards. It just wouldn't happen quickly is what you're really saying, correct? Yeah. In the power grid, you need to have the same frequency. So for instance, here in Europe, it's 50 hertz. So it needs to be stable. How will you have a stable electricity system when demand and supply changes all the time? you have higher demand during the day than during the night. So what we're doing in the power grid right now, and we'll probably do for a long time, is that we figure out, so what is the stable way of delivering electricity? That's something like coal. Coal is actually huge in the US. It's not political correct. It's also polluted a lot. And if you start to clean it, it's very, very expensive. But we're using a lot of coal. We're also using natural gas. But it's because it's a more stable resource and we can store it and we can also transport it if we have to. That's one of the other things that Musk has taken on with these uh, battery storage capacitors, basically, where he stores this energy when it's in high demand or whenever it's cheaply being produced. You can actually, uh, the thing that he's designing is a large battery power unit that you would put into your house that you could then store and you could draw and charge that thing whenever the energy costs are cheaper. And you could then draw on it whenever the uh, energy costs are, are more expensive. So it's interesting that he's he's trying to tackle these problems that Stig's talking about. The issue is really how do you go about distributing these to a very large audience so that it actually starts having a impact around the world where he's nowhere close to that at this point. Yeah, and I think you bring up a good point here. And just to give you some numbers for comparison. So if you look at renewable energies, including hydro, wind, solar that's less than 10% of the global energy. And we see a lot of great developments here in the, in the Western world. But there's, here's another thing. That's not what the rest of the world uses. In China, they're huge on coal, for instance. In the States, they use something like 10 to 12 times as much oil as they do in China. And China is uh, on the way right now. So even though that we might come up with a lot of great inventions here in the West, the rest of the world is developing as well. And they're not using the same technology, at least not yet. So I think Stig's point, and he's not coming out and directly saying this, but I think what Stig's trying to say is next time you open up Bloomberg.com or you're reading the Wall Street Journal and you read some swoopy article about how Elon Musk is going to change you know, the world with energy and how it's all going to be different in a year from now or three years from now, don't buy into the hype. And I would agree with that. I think that it, it's it's something that catches a person's attention because it's something new and it's something that's changing the world. And it is. 
but it's not going to do it at the pace that I think some people think that it's going to occur, especially in in developing countries. And you go over to China and some other places that is not going to happen quickly. That's a change in mindset and culture here in the U S we're wanting to quickly adapt this and move in a different direction. But I can tell you, I think in the rest of the world, it's not as nearly uh, guarded as something that has to happen quickly or, or soon. So the important thing as an investor, when you're looking at this is the trend and the kind of the, the delta and the change as it occurs so that you don't get left in the dust. Because eventually, I think a lot of this stuff is going to kind of take hold, but it's going to be decades from now. And you kind of know when that pendulum is starting to swing the other way. And the only way you can do that is really kind of look at the big picture, look at those percentages and how they're shifting from maybe gas to to electricity to whatever. OK, that's for you to really kind of do your research and your homework. But you got to look at that trend in, in the direction that it's going. And I think that's what Stig's really getting at with his comments. Yeah, and just to uh, to round this discussion off about energy independence, we actually just got a confirmation from Gail Zwerberg that runs the site Our Finance World. And for me, I've been following her blog for quite some time. For me, together with Morgan Downey, and those two know each other, by the way, they're the two top authorities in terms of educating people about oil. It's going to be an awesome episode. And before we are we move on, I also want to talk about, I wrote a blog post about the intrinsic value of oil calculated to be 75.6, which is just give you an idea of that's probably not the right number if I put it on you know, a decimal. But I come up with some arguments why that might be the case. And I'm just extremely curious to hear what you guys think about the model and, uh, and your take on oil as well. So I'm curious, what would be the time frame that you expect it to get to that price? Do you have any estimate on like how long it would take to get to $76? No. And this is actually the, the really interesting thing because I've looked at a, at a time series back to 1970. And I should probably be completely upfront and said, this is mainly the work of my colleague, Professor uh, Morton Peterson, that has created a model based on Hotelling's rule. And what Hotelling did in 1931 was that he said, all assets have some kind of intrinsic value. And the market is somewhat good at estimating its worth, but they're just not right all the time. So this model is basically looking at the development since 1970 and then saying, well, the market is probably somewhat correct since that time. So we don't have a a starting point in that sense, but how much should oil be valued at right now if the market is somewhat efficient in the long run? That's like the overall premise. So we can't say it will happen like in a month. I don't think you can have any model saying that or in five years. That's just the fundamental value. Sort of like saying, I bought a stock. It's worth $50, but I bought it at 20. When would that happen? I don't know, but value is a driver in itself. So one of the fun things about having a podcast and kind of having a blog is we can float ideas out to the audience and then you guys go in there and comment and tell him why he's wrong. So please do. <laughs> that's what that's what Stig's wanting you to do is read his blog post and maybe help him shape his, this thesis that he has and what he's trying to develop. So with all of that said, that's our long review of T Boone's book. The first billion is the hardest. Stig's gonna probably, you know, title his the first trillion's the hardest someday. <laughs> Yeah, now that I estimated the intrinsic value of oil, like the first person <laughs> in the world, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's our review for the book. We also have an executive summary of this book that kind of goes chapter by chapter and kind of outlines everything that's in it. So if you guys want to read the executive summary and just kind of skim through it and see what the book's all about, we send that out to everybody on our email list. So sign up on our email list. It's 100% free. We don't send out any spam or advertising or any of that kind of stuff. So Feel free to sign up on that and and not have to worry about seeing anything from us other than two times a month. So let's go ahead and take some questions from the audience. So Stig, uh, who do we got? Yeah, and our first question comes from James Foreigner. Hi, Preston and Stig. So a couple of weeks back, you had a fascinating discussion on your podcast regarding Exxon Mobile stock and specifically its buyback policy and now dividend policy. I was wondering if you could further elaborate on what you look for in companies pursuing buybacks or paying dividends. And more broadly, what red flags do you look for when looking at a potential investment? Thanks a lot. So, James, this is a fantastic question. I think it's a really kind of simple response for share buybacks. Look at it the same exact way of how you would buy stock yourself. So right now, when you look at the market, it's highly priced in the U.S., at least the U.S. equity market, probably about a 4% return at current market prices. So if a company's buying back their stock at that point in time, and they're not doing other things with the money, maybe 
you know, for me, I'd be investing in maybe a new product, R and D, something like that. That's going to give me a, a bigger return in the long run than 4%. I think that that's a better use of your money. Now, the company might not have a product to produce. There might be other implications. And that's where you really got to do your homework and kind of dig in and see why they're doing the stock purchase. But for the most part, if you're buying right now and you're a large cap company in the U.S., you're going to get a 4% return with over the next 10 years annually at the current market price. So the way you really have to look at it when the company is doing it is you got to look at it in the same context. Would I be buying back stock? So let's fast forward and say we just had a major drawdown in, in the U.S. equity market and it was offering much lower prices. If I saw a company buying back their stock and they were safe and they had you know enough money in their war chest to weather the, the downturn and the credit contraction, if they were in that position, they're buying back stock. I see that as a really good thing because they're basically compounding for me by using that as retained earnings. And they're doing it in a tax advantageous way whenever they're buying back stock opposed to issuing dividends to me as a shareholder. That's one of the reasons why Warren Buffett doesn't pay a dividend is because of the tax disadvantages and his ability to compound the money. So those are some of the key variables as far as I'm concerned whenever I'm looking at a dividend versus a stock repurchase. There's a lot of companies out there where I'd rather take the dividend because I don't think their ability to actually compound the returns are that good. And so that's where you might want to prefer a dividend over a share buyback. I think you uh, you were spot on, Preston, when you said it's really not so much about should it be buyback or should it be dividend. It's more a question of saying, where can the money best be put to use? And as you also suggest, it might be retained earnings. It's not like you can't say, hmm, this company is really good because they have been increasing dividend for 20 years. It might give you a good indication of it's a very stable company, but it really doesn't tell you that is the approach that puts the capital best to use. and. I think it would be unrealistic to look at a company and say, well, the stocks probably haven't been undervalued for 20 years. If I can go back and say, well, they cut the dividend back in 2009, and it was actually going okay back then, but the stock was just really, really cheap. For me, this is, that's not a red flag. I can see why it would be a red flag to a lot of people because they're looking at dividends saying, why do they cut dividend? But I think the problem probably rather lies in the management caring so much about a dividend cut, how it signals something wrong in the short run to investors and really not look out for them in the long run. And it kind of seem like it's the same as giving your son a chocolate bar because you don't want him to scream or whatever. And it's really a question of what is best in the long run. And when you look more into dividends, you start looking at payout ratio, which might be a good place to start. And even more importantly, into the cash flow statement and the cash reserve on the balance sheet, then you'll have a somewhat good understanding of how is it actually that they are using their cash, how safe is the company, and how good are they to not store cash inside the company when they don't need to. All right. So let's go to the next question. The next one comes from Wesley. And here we go. Hey, Preston and Stig. My name is Wesley and just a bit of a background. I'm a medical student, so I've never done any business courses in high school or in university. So thanks very much for doing this podcast because it's a great place for me to learn how to invest. So from your podcast, I've learned that you got to look at the PE ratio. Um, you want to look at the APS. You want to look at also the board of directors. So all of that's overwhelming, um, especially for someone who has no business background. So I was wondering if there's one parameter that will tip you over towards buying or not buying a stock. If this is there just one trait of a stock that will you know de become the deciding factor in either buying or not buying the stock. Thanks very much for that. So the best analogy, and Wesley, this is a great question. We hear this one a lot. And I love the fact that you're, you're digging into business as a doctor. That's pretty cool. So I used to fly helicopters. I've mentioned this a couple of times on the show. So the Apache helicopter, when you go in and you sit in this helicopter, there are so many buttons and knobs and, you know, you push the wrong thing and you might shoot a missile and you got all sorts of things happening inside of this cockpit. And it'd be kind of like asking me, to sit down in that helicopter and I have to fly it, but I can only look at one gauge and I've got to, you know, I can't look outside. I can only look at one gauge and I've got to fly it. And I tell you, I, I would never take that on. And I'll talk a little bit more with this analogy. So when you first start learning how to fly, you do a thing called instruments. And when you're instrument flying, what you do is you 
you wear it on your helmet, you put a visor down, and the visor shields your ability to see outside of the cockpit. All you can see are your gauges. And this is kind of an intimidating portion of your flight training, military flight training at least, that you really have to rely on your instruments and you have to fly the helicopter from one airport to the other and you're not allowed to look outside the windows at all. You have to only look at your gauges. Let's say my altimeter, I'm supposed to be flying at 1,000 feet because of the obstacles on the ground. And that would be something that I would have done in my flight planning before I left. I'd be looking at that and saying, okay, I've got to fly at 1,000 feet to miss every obstacle. And that's just an example. So as I'm flying along and I, I look at my altimeter, I might see that it's a, at 1,050. So I'm a little high. I need to come down. So I adjust the stick to move down a little bit. But now i got to look at all the other gauges because maybe my airspeed's getting slow and I might start stalling. Okay, so I'm looking at all these different gauges and I'm constantly going through them to see the changes and I'm making small adjustments to the controls in order to try to keep this thing just afloat. Investing in companies, in my opinion, is the exact same thing. You have to constantly look at all these different gauges in order to know how something's performing and how it's getting to an end state that you want to achieve. So when you look at a company, there's some really key metrics that I would say are those gauges that you've got to be looking at. One of the most important ones is the earnings, the EPS, the earnings per share. Another one that uses the EPS, the earnings per share, is the PE ratio. The E in the PE ratio is the earnings. The P is the price that you're currently paying for that exact point in time. So what you're doing is you're comparing, okay, what is somebody on the market offering as a price to buy this stock and then how much profit or earnings are there in order to own it. So let's say I paid a hundred dollars for a company that was earning 10 bucks. Okay. So I could expect a 10% return on that. My PE would be a 10. Okay. Cause it, the price is a hundred divided by 10 is the earnings. Those are just two small metrics that you're looking at when you're assessing the value of a company. So as you go further, you got to determine what those key gauges are for yourself as an investor. Stig and I came up with a checklist that you can download if you go to buffettsbooks.com or you go to the Investor's Podcast. We have little pop-ups and stuff for you to download this checklist. But on that checklist, we basically laid out what we thought some of those key gauges were and some of those critical variables that you really have to be able to continue to watch in order to know that your company is on track and flying in the right direction. So it's kind of a long response, and I apologize if you didn't like the analogy. I think that it makes sense from my vantage point based on my background, but I can't give you just one metric. But if I was going to tell you one thing that's really, really important, it's the earnings on the company. Yeah, I think if I have to come up with one metric, it should be valuation. And that's a tricky answer because valuation is composed of so many other metrics <laughs> that it's probably not fair for me to say. But I think it's really important that whenever you buy something, you just start with this simple notion of what is it worth and then go out from there. And the interesting thing for me is that no asset is really so horrible that you wouldn't buy it at the right price. At least that's how I look at it. And before I... I'm going to return to your question. I'm just going to mention Horsehead Holdings right now. And it's a, it's a very interesting company because they're going through a bankruptcy right now. And what's really interesting about that company is that the market cap is like $8 million right now. KPMG, I just read an report from them. They estimate the value to be between $800 and $1.4 billion. I don't completely agree with their approach, but it's interesting to see how much value they can find in there. Guy Spear, who invested in the company, he's saying that the equity is in excess of $400 million. So this is a special situation, or what we call a special situation in stock investing. It's definitely not something I would like to recommend to a beginner. But it just underlines my whole point of saying that even though there, there are no promise that you ever see one cent if you buy like really horrible looking assets, everything is a question of upside versus downside. And you can only lose what you invest. So that's what you can lose. But what is, the, what is the upside for you? And that really l relates back to valuation. So figure out how much is, is it worth and how much does it cost? And that's really the two factors where you should start your research. And that really relates back to what Preston is saying, because what is it worth is basically just the cash that they generate discounted back to today. So no, don't look at a single key ratio. You can, if you have to, look at valuation and then look at the key ratios that you use to, to calculate the valuation based on that. So I have one final follow-up point to what Sting and I were talking about as far as the valuation. 
When you talk about a valuation on a company, you're talking about a multiple that you're paying on the earnings. So in the example that I provided with a hundred dollar company trading on the stock market and it has ten dollars of earnings, you're trading in a multiple of ten. It will take you ten years to get back the principal that you initially invested through the earnings itself. Now where this conversation gets really interesting and where people really need to understand how valuations work, it really comes down to the competitive nature and the competitive advantage of the business. So let me take an example of Google. So when you look at Google, they have a huge competitive advantage just in the fact that when you go on the internet, what do you type almost out of just sheer habit when you log on to any internet browser? You type in google.com because you're going to search for something. That act is a branding situation that has an enormous competitive advantage that has been ingrained and indoctrinated into the world's culture of how they use the internet. That is something that is enormously difficult to overcome. That is a competitive advantage. So for me, I'm willing to pay, assuming that they make a lot of profit on that, which they do. I want to say Google's margins are 20%, maybe even higher, 25%, somewhere around there. Those are huge margins. Typically, if a company's doing really well, they'll have 10% margins. If you're in like a competitive industry like the defense industry, maybe 5 to 7% margins. So those margins, when you make a dollar and you're able to keep 30 cents of it, that's a very big margin. And so I'm willing to pay more and pay a higher premium on those earnings for a company like that. And they can protect the margin. That's the important part. I think they can protect that margin because of the psychology that's built into it. That's a competitive advantage. So if you see that that competitive advantage is an enduring one, and Warren Buffett talks a lot about this, this enduring competitive advantage, that's something worth paying maybe a premium for. And that's completely in the eye of the beholder. And that could change. There could be something revolutionary that kind of comes along that would change it that maybe you all start using Yahoo. I don't know what that could possibly be. I can't quantify that. And that's where you really kind of know you have something is when you literally can't come up with a quantification on how something could be destroyed or it could be really kind of challenged in the in a competitive market. But I think that that last part is very important when you're talking about the price and the value that you think something's worth. You have to tie in this qualitative piece into the quantitative analysis. All right. So the next question that we have, this will be the last one that we do, comes from Yoella. Hi, Preston. Hi, Stig. Thank you for putting in so much of your time to help us learn how to invest more responsibly. I recently found your website and I'm amazed. There are very few websites out there that provide as much valuable investing education as yours does, and I so appreciate the executive summaries. I've been reading The Intelligent Investor since December. It is now late February, and even though I'll keep reading it, it sure is nice to have your summaries around. I recently listened to Podcast 36 with Joe Schmidt talking about how he started his own stock exchange to help mitigate the negative components of high-frequency trading. And my question is, when I place an order, say to either buy an equity or buy or sell an option, I have the opportunity to state the limit of how much I'm willing to spend as opposed to accepting the market price. So I don't understand how HFT would impact this. And this is what's confusing me. Thank you for taking the time to read and answer my question. Wow, that's a, that's a great question. The short answer is you probably shouldn't be worried about high frequency trading especially because you use limit orders. So just for anyone out there, a limit order is that you would say, I want to pay 20 bucks for this stock. And if it's not 20 bucks, you won't buy it. And I think this type of order makes a lot of sense to me because I don't want to place a so-called market order, which is basically the, the cheapest offer price that you can find out there. And that someone else decide how, how much I should pay for my stock. And that is basically what you're hoping for. And that's also how high frequency trading can influence the market price. Because if enough people see that you will go out and buy it at whatever price is the cheapest, that's when you have these uh, really, really fast machines that can just pull away that price and you will have to pay a higher price. Obviously, you don't make that impact if you buy, call it a few hundred shares of a $20 stock. But if enough people are doing it, or if you have these big investors out there or traders, they usually do this in blocks. So that might be buying 100 shares at the time, but they might have like 10,000 stocks under there. Then they will actually move the market. And since they're trading so frequently, they might be losing, call it 0.12%. 
But still, that's a lot of money if you keep making, say, a few hundred trades a day. That's definitely something you need to to pay attention to. So I think for the normal trader, I think the game has somewhat changed. I used to trade on uh, commodities exchanges a few years ago, and I could just see that it started to be more algorithm-based. And you would just see not only that the market would be irrational, but also that there was something else going on. That something was just happening so fast that you couldn't have a real person doing it. And especially if it's as thinly traded as something like commodities, and in this case it was electricity, you will actually see a big drawback if you are using the old form of market orders. All right, guys. So that's all we have for you this week. We enjoy doing the review of the book, The First Billion is the Hardest. If you guys want to get our executive summary, sign up on our email list. If you want to listen to this book for free, go to our website and click on any of the links that we have for Audibles. And if you do that, the first book that you sign up for through Audibles will be completely free. And uh, you can take that as a gift from Stig and I. The Audible service is through Amazon. So if you can find a book on Amazon that's in the Audible format, which is pretty easy to do, you have access to probably the biggest library of audiobooks on the entire planet. We use Audibles for every single book that we use, and we highly endorse that for people to really kind of continue to grow their knowledge. If you guys are leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you guys are listening to the show, Stig and I just want to say thank you so much. We're fastly approaching 100 episodes, and it's kind of mind-blowing and eye-opening to us that we're that far along with our show, but it's all because of the help from our audience, and we cannot thank you guys enough for everything that you've done to help promote our show, help bring it up in the rankings. I know we've we've been as high as in like the top 10 in the world for business podcasts, and that's just so humbling. I can't even tell you how humbled I am just stating that. That's just crazy. And we just really appreciate our audience and we just want you guys to know that. So thanks for listening to this episode and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to the investors podcast to listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show. Be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to the investors podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application. 